another successful and kind of key personality of the Munich ecosystem, who has uh, taken on a mission to bring more uh, female um, women, girls, into science, into math, into technical fields, and bring these women also into leadership roles. And I think when I heard her story first, I was amazed because I thought like, yes, this is kind of needed. Um, but that was someone uh, coming from someone who had already like tons of years uh, into this industry. And Alev actually studied film production first before coming to this STEM fields, um, had to endure some um, positive and negative experiences um, and is here uh, today with us to tell us the journey of funding female tech leaders who has taken on this mission. So, welcome, Alev. Thanks a lot for joining us today and tonight. Um, I think my first question to you would be, um, how come at, I think you're 28, um, you, talk, you took on this mission, which is a huge uh, vision to bring more female into tech fields. How did this idea come from? Because um, I understood from our talk uh, previously that um, you didn't have actually this kind of path uh, or these ideas um, at first to become an engineer. Um, yeah, so I think that might be exactly the reason why I thought about it. Because I, as you said, I studied film production first, so I was in the more artistic field at first and then switched to informatics. And that switch was from something where there was actually a pretty equal gender ratio to something where suddenly I was in class and I was the only woman in the classroom in like a big hall at LMU. And I think that's where I already started to notice that, okay, this feels a little different. I feel different. I feel like I'm not really part of this crowd because a lot of people that were studying informatics were also people that had already previous experience in it. And um, these initial insecurities and also the you know famous imposter syndrome, I think, were kind of what really got me into thinking, okay, what can we do so that there are more women with, with me in this, in this class? And whenever I would meet another woman, I would stick to her and not let her go. And whenever there was a question about a class, instead of raising my hand in class, I would just go to my girlfriends and ask them afterwards. And felt like they also have a similar problem. Mm -hmm. so, so what was it the lack of mentor, the lack of, in your family, was no background or no tech um, um, track record where you could just go to, or your friends were more from, as, I, as you said, you study film production, um, so rather on more the artistic side, nobody to ask help. Yeah, from. pretty much. I mean, it was, it was, um, I was new to Munich also when I started mm -hmm. to uh, study informatics, so I did not have the biggest circle of friends yet. So my only social circle was also the classmates in school. And it was also fine to work with the men, which was totally fine. I mean, we were in group projects all the time, but I still felt that I felt a little bit uncomfortable asking them questions because they were already also experienced. And whenever I would meet a woman, she was also not as experienced. So it was a little bit of a, okay, we're similar and we can be open about what we don't know in class and it felt more comfortable to share. And I think that's what, yeah. And what made you uh, switch actually from film production to, to, to the STEM fields? Is that because like the, you felt that you were missing a little bit of the quant or it was just not a passion of yours, maybe just to switch your career at this point? Um, I get that question really often because it seems so random, something that would actually, you know, more artistic creative to something so logical and rational. And um, it was actually, so I was studying in Los Angeles. I was um, working mostly with a camera. And that was already relatively more technical than, I guess, artistic or creative. Mm -hmm. So I already had a little bit of experience with the more technical side of, of uh, film production. And I, like, since I was little, I would say I was always really into building things and um, yeah, making up things from scratch. And I read this um, article once where Elon Musk said something like, don't choose an industry or a field, but choose what characteristics you embody and where they are put to practice mm -hmm. best. And I always found myself being someone who likes to build things, but also likes community. 
and also likes to be creative. So I think this can be many fields. It can be film production, it can also be technology, and ultimately also starting an NGO like Female Tech Leaders, because it embodies all of those char three characteristics. So community, creativity, and just building, like building. something from scratch, mm -hmm. yeah. Where in film, it's, you know, syncing up a movie and putting it into the medium. In tech, it's programming something. And ultimately, this led me, I guess, to, to the switch. Because for a project, I went to Sacramento. Mm -hmm. And um, over there, I was exposed to this tech scene. And then I started just taking free classes online and realized, OK, so this, again, this makes me excited. And that's what motivated the And switch. do you find that the, actually the tech community to be kind of uh, inclusive and, and and, and to be actually a community, because I always feel, I mean, sorry, I'm not a tech engineer, so maybe <laughs> outside of this crowd, but like they program, they code, and it's me, myself, and I in front of a computer. But I also feel like a lot of them share knowledge and are very much about open ecosystem, so they're not afraid to actually share information and bring their own uh, expertise and try to build something together yeah. versus other fields of management where like you are in your silo and you try to be successful on your own. Absolutely. I think the tech community is really one where a lot of sharing is going on, also a lot of helping each other out or again like the hackathons, the communities, there's so many of them and um, that is definitely something that I also experienced both in, uh, in Silicon Valley as well as here in Munich. I actually have a friend who studies law and she's always amazed when I tell her that oh yeah so me and my classmates, we're going to do a, uh, an exam together and, and help each other out with the problems. And she cannot believe it at all because law yeah. is a lot more competitive. So that's definitely an aspect to, to informatics and tech. Yeah. Okay, so you learned this from, from Silicon Valley, this, uh, this also passion for community, creativity and building things. Coming back to Germany, then you decide, okay, I want to do my career in, in STEM. So science, technical engineer and math. Um, and then what happens? So you're studying. <laughs> I'm studying and I fail a lot. <laughs> a lot of classes failed, um, a lot of sleepless nights, not knowing the answer to many problems. Um, lots of lots of difficulties, at least the first three semesters of uh, my bachelor's. And now I'm in my master's, so something worked eventually. But at first it was very, very uncomfortable because you keep getting faced with, with another failure and you have to stand back up and try again and try again. And I always say I was very lucky that uh, the universities let you retake finals when you, pass, mm -hmm. when you fail them. And um, yeah, it was, it was really, then I realized after three semesters that it's normal and everyone fails the exams, but not everyone is so open about it. <laughs> like me. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and that made me feel a little better. Okay. And so what made you, I mean, you were talking a little bit about like this um, community and, and feeling part of something, but right. there at LMU, this didn't work out, or you felt you were not at the same level as the, those other guys who had a little bit more level of advanced expertise. Yeah, I mean, it was, I guess it, it was never really something radical against me that I felt, but it was just that I felt more comfortable sharing with my girlfriends. So it was more that. And then I had one negative, one small negative experience uh, in a group project where a classmate actually deleted all of my code and then uploaded it again as his own. And that's where I felt, it was just once, but that's where I felt, okay, this is, you know, he would not have done it probably to a male classmate and he may have not expected for me to speak up, which I ended up speaking up. But I think that was like one thing where I was very, very frustrated and mm. Was that the trigger event, the trigger for one of saying, yeah. okay, we need to do something? We're not going to disclose the name of that person, but you know, <laughs> we should maybe. <laughs> no, but I read, I read somewhere that like only 24% of the women work in, in scientific, technical, engineering, and math classes, yeah. and only 5% go to C-level position in these fields, which is astonishingly low. Yeah. Um, so, and a lot drop out, actually. So okay. they either drop out of university or if they finish studying it and start to start a job in technology, they quit and uh, switch fields, which is also something that uh, that I read. So it's kind of the problem is 
girls don't start to study computer science or technology fields, but then those who do actually leave the field too. So it's really And is that because there is <laughs> such a strong failure rate or you need to retake these exams and then, you know, at some point you just maybe not as motivated anymore and because you're kind of the exception and not the rule there you feel like you're never going to manage i um, i think yeah community and relationships are such an important part of our life right so in work in school it's really important to have to have your crowd to have your people and if you're missing that you may be missing a supportive environment that tells you hey no you're going to go back and you're going to do it again it, it could be one of the reasons, of course, I don't have the answer to it, but it definitely could be that you're lacking this this community, which ultimately is what we're trying to do. Yeah, and especially when some people, I remember an article from, from a Google engineer saying that uh, basically engineering is a part of the DNA of a, of a man and not of a, of a woman, right? <laughs> and that you're born with it or you're not. So that must also oh, like uh, <laughs> bring you to not <laughs> pursue this, uh, this study. So. Yeah. All this trigger kind of certain frustration, so you started um, with a Facebook group. Exactly. So it was just a small group um, on Facebook that I created for um, my classmates that were female. Um, it was not you know female tech leaders, but it was just for LMU informatics female students or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I added my friends and I said, hey, add all of your girlfriends. Let's discuss classes. Like let's discuss. Um, homework, exams. So it's a Facebook in the Facebook. Because that's <laughs> actually how Facebook started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> and um, yeah, so they added their friends and then they added their friends and uh, the conversation in the group started changing over time. So it was not just about LMU classes per se, mm -hmm. but also about startups in Munich or meetups in Munich or events or uh, people would start sharing articles or talk about entrepreneurship. So the conversation transformed. And then people started adding more people that were not from LMU and not students. Men started joining, which was great. It was never against men or excluding men. So it really became like a community. And Can you get the answers from the exams in this Facebook group? <laughs> uh, no, not really. But you can, you can get buddies to help you study. So, yeah. Um, and yeah, over time, that developed. And one day we said, hey, let's all get together sometime and maybe invite someone who is already an accomplished woman to come and speak and give us a little bit of an insight into, into her work life. Mm -hmm. And I am a working student at Siemens, so I was going to just ask my boss. And um, she said yes. But then also I got, through coincidence, I got introduced to someone here at Google, uh, Janina Roy who is a, a senior engineer here, uh, who was also really interested. She said, hey, if, if you're doing this thing where people come and talk, I'll, I'll come, I'd like to talk. So she was on board. And then through another coincidence, I was introduced to a founder, Manuela Rasphofer, from Terra, from Terra Lu. A very great founder, who was also speaking here, actually. <laughs> She's amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and pretty also very deep tech. <laughs> yes. For computer vision for uh, finding out from aerial picture what you can see from, from the satellite, so yeah. being able to identify objects, so use cases in automotive, self-driving car, but also in real estate for insurance, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Really, really amazing stuff. And, and then she was also basically saying, yeah, I would love to come in and, and, and talk. So great, we have these three people that are experienced, they are in tech, let's come together and, and hear them speak. And that ended up being 250 people. So did you find a venue for that? <laughs> actually, Stylite. Okay. It was the first event. It was exactly one year ago. Um, it was at Stylite, and it was huge. So that was the moment where, for me, I realized, okay, so this is not just a Facebook group anymore. There is a big demand. This is really something where we can make a change in the community. People care about this stuff. And out of the 250, how many women? <laughs> Ooh, I would say probably. 220 okay so and not a lot of men but you got an evangelist there um to help you out yeah to become your mentor he's uh, uh johan i always say that he's the uh, kind of the godfather of female tech leaders because whenever i would have a question i would go to him and say what do we do well, there's no catering where do we go and he would say he would be so relaxed and just say oh it's fine i'll just post about it on facebook and then he would find someone in a minute so he really helped us out there Johan Ramofo is the tech evangelist from Skylight. Skylight. yeah and he also uh, ended up offering 
skylight space for our uh, first team meetings and stuff. So mm -hmm. he was very, very supportive. Yeah. Talking about team, how like so you were a non for profit um, yeah. initiative. Um, how did you start recruiting? So you get to you to do your first event with with Manuela with your boss from Siemens and um, and Janina uh, from Google. And what happened next? So how do you actually f make it just like okay, just a Facebook group to actually a professional organization that is trying to empower women? It it happened really fast actually. So at the event that was so big, I spoke in the beginning to introduce myself and, and tell them why this happened. And there I just said, hey, if anybody wants to help me make more of this, come to me and let's, let's get together sometime, let's grab a coffee and talk about it. So that's what the first, I guess, tiny group was, which Joanna, who's sitting there, was one of the first <laughs> as well. And um, we were, I think, after that event, we were five, six, seven people. And I told them what, what the idea was, if they want to be on board, and that I want to take this a little bit more professionally. And um, we divided it into different groups. So there was a team that was going to be doing speaker nights like this, and then there was a team that was going to be doing hackathons like Joanna's team and workshops. So there were different kinds of community projects that we wanted to focus on. And um, we started to go from there. We had weekly meetings at first, and then every team would start meeting weekly, and then the whole team would meet monthly. So we got a little bit of a structure into it, which I had no experience with that at mm -hmm. all, but over time it became a little bit more structured. And the female tech leader name came at that point in time, or was it already the Facebook group? It was somewhere around that time, mm -hmm. yeah. So you started professionalizing. Um, were men welcome to participate? Always, always, okay. always, yeah. So. Um, we actually also have male volunteers, one of which is also, as of now, JP just joined recently uh, for our programming courses. Um, and uh, we have another male volunteer in our marketing team, which the marketing team is doing fantastic. It's uh, absolutely amazing what they do. They, they get our word out there, you know, they let us, let us be known and we're so, we've really grown through them. And uh, yeah, through, at our events, we also always work for men, but unfortunately not a lot of them. And let's let's talk a little bit about actually your events or your your community yes. project. So um, you have the speaking night, you have a mentor program, you have hackathon, uh, you have the what I really like is this Instagram takeover stories mm -hmm. uh, that you do. How did you start structuring this, and where did you see the value add? How do you measure that these action channels are working? Mm -hmm. um, so we started structuring it. So from the beginning, we just knew that we were going to do speaker nights, workshops, and hackathons. That was it. And then as more and more people joined, more teams started forming. So we said, okay, so we're a lot of people also from different backgrounds. So this person is really good at marketing. So then you can just take over the Facebook account and our website. And this person maybe did something with finance. Okay, so you can be our sponsorships, fundraising person. So it really self-organized a little bit. And then we really started to just take everyone's input. Everyone was always very welcome to put their input. And um, we blew up on social media because so many people started also posting about us and sharing about us. So that really, really helped us out, which also led to, again, more people joining. So more people joining had new ideas of how we can grow bigger. And that's really how, how all of these different initiatives started to come. Yeah. And how did you actually start, um, I mean, you were still done for profit, people are not being paid. Um, so how do you get these volunteers to be motivated and help out? Um, how do you resolve conflict with the teams when, you know, some of the direction is not going into the vision that you had? Yeah. Um, well, the good thing is that when it's something is not for profit, people have already an intrinsic motivation to join. Mm -hmm. But you also, I guess, have to get them to stay once they have joined because obviously they are volunteers, you're not paying people. So how do you how do you motivate, how do you reward your team? And for me it was always really important that everyone felt that they have a purpose. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. And everyone felt the result of their impact. So that was one of the things that I tried really hard for every team member to to feel, which is also again the reason why when we are recruiting new volunteers we may be a little bit stricter than other NGOs, 
it's easy to say, okay, it's volunteering, so why is it so hard to participate? But I think it's exactly because of that. So everyone has a lot to do. Everyone has their little baby that they're working on and can really feel the impact of what they're putting their time into. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was very, very important to me all the time. And when there is conflict, I was always a really big fan of full transparency. Everyone gets to uh, talk about it together. We sit down and we discuss, okay, what is the problem? How do we fix it? So everyone feels also valued. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, I mean, and I mean, this is something that is also being talked about sometimes when you have too many women in the same environment, then uh, it's very difficult to, or more conflicts arise, let's put it that way. Um, it's always solvable, but, um, you know, mm. men, women are, uh, can be a little bit more emotional about certain topics than men. So is that something that you've encountered? Not at all, actually. Okay. To be really honest with you, I also don't really buy that. A lot of people say, oh, when a lot of women are together, they get catty. I personally have always been a person I never had problems with other women. Mm -hmm. I was always, I always had a big group of girlfriends. It was always really important to me. But then also what's so special about female tech leaders is that everyone has each other's back. Everyone helps each other. So even cross team help is being done. So when you're in the hackathons team and you're in the speaker night team and the hackathons needs help, they help each other out. So that's really something where I think also in our recruiting, we pay really close attention for a cultural fit mm -hmm. that the person fits into our team. And then we also have this really hilarious value list in our yeah. manifesto that when someone joins, we have everyone read and we show it to them where you know, there are rules like no kanye which means don't interrupt people or don't be an <laughs> asshole. And yeah, so zero tolerance for bullying or zero tolerance for certain kind of cliquish behavior. So these are really things that we also enforce. Okay. So I think these, the combination of things really uh, helps us out, yeah. What I'm astonished about um, um, is, I mean, don't take it the wrong way, but like you came up with all these kind of um, structural, professional way of setting up an organization without even having worked in an organization, right? I mean, um, I've worked 10 years in corporates and, you know, this value list reminds me, for example, of Amazon. So how did you get inspired to do this? Did you get mentors? Did you have like the, the right talent? And how, where did you find these? Um, I think it's twofold. One is we have this amazing advisory board, right? So, so you have not even that. that. You have an advisory board. <laughs> this is very professional. <laughs> um, there's a, yeah, three founders who okay. are also senior founders. They have lots of experience that I meet with them every couple of months and I yeah. ask them everything, every stupid question I can think of. And who, so who are they? They're Jeff Burton from okay. the founder <laughs> yeah. of EA Games and then Lynn Kaiser, mm -hmm. who's a Munich based entrepreneur and Regina Mela, she's yep. the founder of the Women's Speaker Foundation. And they're an amazing, amazing group to ask your questions to. Um, so they've really been helping me out. But until I got them, before that, it was mostly, um, I'm obsessed with watching videos about entrepreneurship. So the startup school, I really love it from YC. I watch it, I watch lots of fireside chats, panels about people who have started companies. Um, I'm obsessed with company culture. So every video or article about culture there is online, I've probably seen it. And if I haven't, send it to me. <laughs> I really, really love it. Um, so I think that combination really helped out. Yeah. Cool. Um, Self-taught um, organizational expert. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would not say, but yeah. Well, I'm trying I'm, to, I'm impressed and I've seen a lot of uh, young uh, entrepreneurs. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one question that actually came to my mind when you know when we say non for profit etc. How do you actually monetize? I mean, you need to organize all these events. We talked about the speaker night. We talked about the mentor program. We talked about hackathon. Mm -hmm. We talked about all this. I mean, yes, nobody's getting paid, but you're still using a lot of different catering venues, um, event events. So yeah. how do you? If you're not doing it yet, how do you plan to do it? Or if you're doing it yet, what is your source of revenue? Yeah, so for us, it's um, this amazing community of also tech companies. Tech companies care about this, like companies like Google or Microsoft, they've been extremely supportive. So when there is an event that we want to do, we go to one of our contacts at the company and we 
we discuss the idea together and they actually they give us the venue and they cover the catering they want to support this because they care about the community so much so that has been really helpful and we're also planning on long-term partnerships mm -hmm. with these companies so we actually have different kinds of partnership plans that we want to get into with them and um, as a as a return they can also have events with us more often which also again helps them to attract people to come to their offices where they can also introduce themselves and it's a win-win really for both and of course we're making an impact together so it's really it's good again like it's it, it really helps you when you are not for profit and when you are doing a good cause it does not take a lot of persuasion because the cause is already persuasion enough mm -hmm. and i guess like having also maybe some members of female tech leader at these companies bring in also kind of some agents or ambassadors of definitely your the contacts brand. the contacts definitely help yeah so um how many members do you have at the moment we actually are 28 now Okay, 28, 28, and it's growing really fast. <laughs> <laughs> Very fast. And in terms of um, reach in, in Munich, um, are you at the moment bringing only the Munich community together, right? So right. you're not yet expanding into other cities in Germany. Uh, it's the plan for this year to okay. expand to other cities in Germany, also in other countries. There's lots of interest because our social media has really grown so fast. I think combined. All of our combined channels have more than 20,000 followers. Mm -hmm. So it's really grown very fast in just a year. Um, and there's always messages coming from San Francisco, London, like other okay. countries. Hey, can you come and do it here? Uh, but for now, we're in Munich, yeah. Okay, so what's next? Because for example, I take one of your uh, community initiative, which is this uh, Instagram takeover. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen this, it's pretty cool. It's uh, basically a successful entrepreneur, but also like a successful engineer or someone who student, has anyone, students yeah. um, out like anywhere in the world, because I've seen some from San Francisco, from Canada, yeah. who is taking over the Instagram account of female tech leader, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm to showcase their journey uh, in their job, what they do, uh, and basically take over um, and relate their story, which uh, yeah. I think is quite successful. So is that your way to reaching out and to kind of bridging to this um, other countries? Absolutely, yeah. So it's really, again, this amazing marketing team that we got. Um, they, they really got into uh, getting into contact with other people, also other people that are very active on social media in tech and they just write them, they befriend them, they get in touch with them and then they suggest the cross promotion and when they also promote us, we promote them and it's really been really helpful for us and it's uh, amazing also for the community here in Munich since most of our followers are from Munich for now to see people from overseas and it's really been helpful to, check, to, to get a, a, an insight into their daily lives. I mean, we have founders but we also have students when there's a computer science student, they ask them questions about, hey, how can I get into computer science? Was it hard for you? And they get this direct answer from a real person that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So what's next? As a, I've read uh, that or uh, we talked about the expansions um, geographically, the US, Canada. Do you, have you already thought about how, how do you want to expand? Like, what's the model you would like to, to set up? Yeah, I think it would be not too different from the startup grind, actually, to have different ambassadors and different representatives in the different help cities. Me. <laughs> I think so. I think I, I can actually give you some, some contacts. <laughs> oh, I'd love the that. headquarters. Yeah, please do, please do. Because I think it would be best, I mean, uh, to have, of course, a representative in another city that, again, creates their own little team or maybe big team and starts to do these community projects. Um, in their own countries. Um, we are also starting in the next few months to visit schools, where mm -hmm. we also go to schools in the Munich area and uh, talk to the younger children because it also has a big... Like primary school and or secondary schools? All kinds of schools. Okay. So secondary school, primary school. Of course, we always talk differently and have different kind of presentation forms for the different age groups. But, um, you know, it's, it's well known that girls start losing interest in math uh, very early on, so mm -hmm. five years old, six years old is already where, where it really declines. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's another project that we're starting this year. And um, a farther project that we're discussing, just conceptualizing right now, is also a form of an accelerator program for female-founded startups. So that's also something that we are um, we're talking about, but 
we don't know yet if that's going to be something to scare. We're still conceptualizing. Shout out to Harry Potter. Hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if we were to like, um, if, if, the, if people in the audience would be willing to help, um, how would they reach out to you? How would they, <clears throat> like, what would you propose to them? Is, is this something like, uh, yeah, I guess there is a structure for everything that you do. So <laughs> just contact me or anyone else in the team um, any way you like. You can come up to me after this. You can write us an email or get in touch with us on any of our other social channels. Um, it's pretty simple, actually. Just let us know and we'll definitely get back to you. Yeah. What, um, so if we go back to, to kind of your uh, um, journey through and, and challenges through building up female tech, what do you think, um, you know, you've done kind of, um, or you, where you had the most challenges and you felt like, okay, if I had to do it again, I would do it differently? For me, I would say it's to delegate more. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, when I first started it, I, I'm just going to be really honest. I did so much by myself because I was so scared that, oh no, if somebody else does it, maybe they won't get it right or maybe I'll, uh, maybe they'll make a mistake or they won't know what to do. And I think I had this really strong urge to, to have the control. And I learned over time that you can let go of control and it's actually even better. And yes, the person might do it differently than you would have had, but it doesn't mean that it's worse. It's just different and they still get the result. So that is something that I learned, I think in the first year and I'm still learning it. To just let go and let more people take control as well. And there's nothing to worry about. You don't have to do everything by yourself. Yeah, I think this is also something that uh, a lot of entrepreneurs uh, experience. Yeah, because you know, you're a baby and the you're... The stage from like, we are two or three co-founder and then we need to hire and then I need to actually like, let go the sales and marketing and I need to focus on the like, fundraising or, yeah. And I, it's so scary. This quite a few times and this <laughs> is where it's also like, it's a break for me. Also, that's at the very early stage, but I guess also at the very later stage when you actually start growing from like, you know, 25 people to 100 mm -hmm. and finding the right talent. So how do you actually like, let's say you want to extend to the US, to Canada, to uh, other German cities. Um, how do you recruit the best talent? How do you know that these are actually the guys who are going to be able to represent your brand, your vision going forward? So we are uh, currently finalizing like a process kind of, again, it's we're small, but it's, we're trying to make it professional so that as it grows, it can stay that way mm -hmm. and we have less growing pains. Um, we're trying to come up with a process and a procedure to onboard new members. Um, currently, we have people send us their resumes and a motivational letter, much like it is everywhere else. And then the people who are actually currently doing exactly that, for example, speaker nights or hackathons or programming courses, are screening them and are getting in touch with them and talking to them and overseas it would be over Skype or Hangouts um, and then we have multiple stages as well so as they get to know them better maybe new members come and join and get to know them as well so it's not just one person's decision it's nicely divided um, and yeah it's kind of and it's very well structured and do you actually bring them here in Munich to experience kind of the setup here first before going back to their home country? I don't think we have the means to do that yet. It would be perfect <laughs> if we could, but that's just not in the picture right now. But for example, there are people who come to Munich or happen to be in Munich at an event, but they don't live here that also contacted us and said, hey, I live in Berlin and I want to take it there. Let me know when your red check's found. We'd like to, we'd like to do it there as well. So. Yeah, and I think the further you reach grow, then the, the more chapters you will have yeah. across cities where people can actually get to know you through other yeah. uh, means. Totally. And we have like an onboarding way as well. So okay. one of them is the, you know, we're presenting the manifesto and the other one is the rules, the values. And so that's also been really helpful so that the voice of FTL stays the same regardless where we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the values that we have for Yeah, I really like them. <laughs> I saw them. This is what we I like to this also one relay to <laughs> Yeah. Um, what do you wish for in terms of 
what could your organization bring to to women in general or to inclusion? Because I mean, we're talking about women as a as a minority in the STEM fields, but we could also talk about other minorities in other type of C level positions. So, what's your um, overarching goal in in making this happen for this female tech leaders? I always say that female tech leaders have reached a goal when it becomes not necessary anymore. When we can basically pack up and stop. Which basically means when there is an equal gender ratio in technology and leadership, which we're very far away from still right now, right? But we're yeah, making well, small steps. Five percent is <laughs> <laughs> well you you're gonna be you're making yourself sustainable for a while. <laughs> but that is the goal. The goal is to become not necessary. We're working towards that, where there's no need for raising awareness, no need for you know, going to schools, encouraging younger children, motivating women who maybe are already professionals. So that's really something that we, we really care about. Our goal is just to have an equal gender ratio. And I guess coming from the source, which are like um, starting at the, at the school level, brings this new generation of people aware of yeah. what, what each gender can do. And yeah. And this equality mindset. Yeah, mindset. I think if you're if you're you know uh, five or six years old, let's say, or even fifteen years old, and someone comes to your class and they don't look like the stereotypical programmer with glasses and you know what you picture when you when you look at I don't know comics of, of programmers or look at movies <coughs> where there's a programmer and someone presents to you and they look like you, it's a girl and she, you know, is not the stereotype that you think that you would have expected, it already makes a small change in the mind. It's, it's unexpected and the children feel more that they can identify with them. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea behind it, yeah. And I have a little bit of a um, challenging question. So what okay. do you think about, um, there's this gender talks, I guess, not only in France where I come from, but also in other countries in Europe. It, when is gender actually being decided? Um, and are you in favor, for example, of um, you know choosing gifts for the little one in terms of the gender? Do you think this, for example, bringing a, a doll for a, a girl yeah. and a car for a, a little boy, do you think that already kind of make them um, skewed towards a certain field or a certain yeah, capability? I do. I do. I think it's very much you know, influencing the child. If you, if you give someone dolls and, and a little paper and pens, and then you give another person building blocks, you give the boy building blocks and cars or things that they can take apart and put together, it already influences the mindset. And also in the first years of your life, you know, your brain still expands, your brain is still forming. And if you're, you know, already learning to put together little blocks early and you're a boy, mm -hmm. then it could also be that when you're in school, you find the logical and rational classes more interesting than the art classes. So definitely, I think we should stop giving these gender <laughs> stereotype toys to children and just let them. That's a very choose. big uh, vision also for, for society. So maybe we don't start at the primary school, but we even start at the kindergarten. <laughs> That'd be cool, actually, um, yeah. <laughs> in terms of uh, coding, coding yeah. skills. Um, let's then move then to my last subject, Munich. Um, what do you think like we are enjoying here in Munich, which makes it a very good ecosystem and what we should also continue to do and what, um, we, what we're missing, what we need to change to make the, the, the city, the region much more buoying in terms of entrepreneurial activities and this community that we are talking about and this creativity and this triangle, yeah. community creativity building blocks. I think we are very lucky here in Munich that we have such a big meetup meetup community, big community of lots of events going on, also lots of free events, networking events to get people together. I think it's brilliant and that's really something we should continue to do. Lots of support also from companies to have these meetups, not just for tech, there's also meetups for, for really everything else. I think if you go and click on meetup.com um, here in Munich, and I've actually meet, meet, met some people who came from other cities that said that, man, I wish that there was something where I could get together with other developers or other entrepreneurship enthusiasts and, and discuss or invite a speaker, but there's just none in my town, which I always say, go and create one, and <laughs> that's what we want. We should do it, it's easy, just go for it. But we're very blessed with that, which other cities don't have that. And 
Yeah, it's very interesting to do that. And anything that we can improve? For more female speakers, yes. for example? I think, <laughs> yeah, I think women need to be more courageous to go and speak, even mm -hmm. um, if they're not as experienced. For example, me, when I first had to go up on stage, and even up, even today, right now, I'm always freaking out. And, you oh, know, it's, uh, it's a very nice audience. <laughs> they haven't asked any questions yeah. yet. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I think just women should be more and more courageous to just go and do it and really it's always the case that the audience is nice, always. I think in the rarest cases have I heard that an audience said, some, said something mean when someone made a mistake. So if anyone here is female and considering to give a talk, definitely go for it because um, we need more speakers at events that are female for sure. I agree. I have a hard time finding female speakers, and I want more female speakers too. Sometimes they need a little push. Sometimes, yeah. Actually, I'm going to quote you. Um, you had a super nice um, blog on Medium about finding female X speakers, and you say your next speaker does not need to be someone who is already in the news every day. It can be anyone. Um, I'm a curious person, and I try to find something interesting and worth admiring in everyone I meet. Every person has a story, something that they are good at, or something that makes them special. I try to look for that and highlight it in people. So I will finish on this because I think it's a super nice quote. That mm -hmm. makes you very, like, uh, it just, yeah, touches on me a lot. And I think a lot of more women will come on stage and will share the stories as you did today. So yeah. to, well, to thank you uh, a lot. I um, We brought this from the team, so these are branded chocolates, female tech leaders, and Oh my right. god, they have our logo. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot for sharing your story. Thank you. But I don't want to, you know, uh, keep the audience waiting, so I would like to open up the floor for any questions. Um, and Nishi and JP have mic, so please. I'm just wondering if you're doing this full time or <coughs> next to some other work and what that would be. I'm actually still a student, so I'm in my I'm doing my third degree right now. I'm doing a master's in informatics, and um, I'm a full time student. And I also kind of do this full time, which is probably not the best decision, <laughs> but I just do. Um, but then I also work as a working student at Siemens, actually. So yeah, full agenda. <laughs> Very much so, yeah. So based on that, what will be the next step for you once you finish your studies, your, 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 you know, university, and then you will keep going with your project, it will just open up and move somewhere else? I really would like to continue doing this. Uh, I don't know if full-time is realistic right now to just stop everything and do this, because it is not for profit and we are still figuring ourselves out, it's been only a year, and we're still developing our, our revenue model, so to speak. So it will really depend on where that goes, but in an ideal world, yeah, I would do that. Yeah? Um, do you, um, okay, sure. um, do you have um, any ideas for how to get more men interested in female tech leaders? Because, like, I think God bless all you guys for being here tonight. But why is it when we say it's female something or other, like we're specifically having female speakers, mostly women show up, and why is it that men don't show up? Like, how know? do we change So maybe we that? should applaud the yeah. 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 Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you for understanding. We have something to say as well. <laughs> Um, I think there are lots of factors that weigh in. One of them is definitely that I think, you know, men might feel a little uncomfortable being in a room full of women where there is the talk about women in tech events, why there aren't many. Um, I think it's very similar to how a woman in a computer science hall feels uncomfortable being the only woman. So it's a little bit, it's new, it's different, and it's a little uncomfortable. And then also, I think I was once uh, in a panel discussion where the panel discussion was much like this, where the audience could participate. And a man raised his hand and said, I actually don't feel like I should speak right now because I feel that I shouldn't say anything or I shouldn't add anything because it's not my place. I feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. speaking. So they, I think some also feel not as welcome, even though they are. So what we can do or what we should do, um, you know, 
organizers as well as audience members is to just keep making it more inviting as much as we can for uh, male participants and to make it clear that it's the dialogue that we want. It's exactly we want to go against the you know gender disparity so we need them to participate mm -hmm. and, and then a follow-up question i've actually not been to one of your events so when you speak is it about women in tech or is it about a technology topic that's discussed exclusively or is it about the fact that we are women doing something in technology or is it just about the technology it's both actually so mm -hmm. we have some events that are for example one where jacqueline was also speaking Right there, Jacqueline spoke. She's also founder of Pumpkin Organic. Uh, she gave a talk just, you know, because she's a woman and she's a founder, we wanted to hear her story. Mm -hmm. So we have those. But then we also have technical talks where we invite maybe a researcher um, who speaks about her research, which is also a woman. Um, but then also male researchers come as well. And then we also have as of new programming courses where we just teach skills, uh, teach coding skills, introductory uh, programming skills. So sometimes it's just about the technology. Other times it's for empowerment and for inspiration. Mm -hmm. And then those events are always open for men as well. Yeah. And then one more thing, <laughs> sorry. Um, I would like to offer my services to any women in here. If you're interested to speak, I love presenting. I love creating presentations. I love teaching uh, the skills for presenting. So if you're thinking about, mm, I'd like to, but I really don't know how, like come and talk to me and I'm really yes. happy to like, to coach and come up with some great presentations so yeah. maybe you can give a workshop for female tech leaders totally can do it absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. go to her <laughs> thank you yes the microscope thank you okay so i'm coming from uh, i'm in a, i work in a startup and we also have a tech team because it's a tech startup and they're only guys and i was wondering what can we as a company do to promote us for more women tech leaders, so for more women, because we have the point that no woman is applying for our jobs, really, mm -hmm. and we would love to have more because we would love to be more diverse, yeah. but we don't get them. So is there anything where we say, okay, I'm not so, <laughs> where we can go to and find them or to do something or give them some benefits so they would love to come to us? I think this is such a difficult subject because every tech company has this problem, right? Like even Google would love to have more female engineers. And there's so many speculations and factors that might be the reason for, let's say, why don't women apply. Um, off the top of my head, I probably cannot answer your question right now and solve your problem. If I could, I think that'd be awesome, <laughs> but I can't. But there's so many speculations and factors going into it. Like one of which, for example, which is very common is that there is there is a study that women um, tend to not apply for a job description if they don't meet 100% mm -hmm. of all of the points versus men, they might just meet five or six and they'll be like, yeah, it's fine. I'll just see where it goes. And they apply and then they get the job because they applied. Um, and then women are more hesitant because we want to know everything before we actually commit to this so we don't disappoint anyone. Um, that can be a reason, so I think you could try to see if you can change up maybe the job description, if it makes a difference. But then sometimes it's also just exposing yourself to more women. Oftentimes they may not know that you exist because there's already such a small pool of women engineers in the world. So maybe it needs to, you know, it needs to take a little bit more marketing to reach them. You could come to our events, you could help have an event with us because we have so many female engineers coming um, to our events and just show them that you exist more. Thank you.